What's up, everybody? Tim Anderson here, a.k.a. Renfield, the Bearded Dwarven Princess, and we are back with another Rings of Power rant video. And today we're talking about the disowned son of Christopher Tolkien, one Simon Tolkien, who went from being a disowned child because of his participation in the Peter Jackson films to now being the golden goose, so to speak, for the showrunners of Rings of Power. It's a crazy tale of... Who knows? We're going to dive into it today. Uh, so, hope you brought your boots, because it's going to get thick, and we're going to do a little bit of wading as we go through everything. So, um, we had some articles shared to me uh, recently over the weekend, uh, diving into the announcements um, about Peter Jackson and Simon Tolkien and all this other stuff, and led to this article about how Simon Tolkien helped guide the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. This is at uh, entertainment ew.com i'll put a link down there in the description below so of course those of you who want to read it at your leisure can do so but basically this article just goes through and shows how um <laughs> i love how it says it lord of the rings fans know that every good journey needs a traveling companion so when showrunners jd Payne and patrick mckay started shaping their new tv series rings proud they recruited an important ally to join them on their journey Simon Tolkien. Simon serves as a series consultant, and Payne and McKay say his contributions to the show have been invaluable. Not only is Tolkien an accomplished novelist, well, that might be debated. He's definitely written some novels. I don't know that they have been hugely popular. I, I know he has complained in public that he feels like his grandfather's name has overshadowed him and sort of been like a black mark against him in the publishing industry leading to him not being as successful as he thought he might have been otherwise. Um, so, but he is a writer at the very least. He's Hell, he's had more books published professionally than I have. Let's just put it that way. In any case, um, the showrunners sh say that he had a key role in helping to shape the show's story and character art development, especially given his expertise and insight into his grandfather's work. All right, here's where we need to pause for a minute, because... For those of you who don't remember, if we go back to the Peter Jackson films, there's actually a live article on the EW website from back in December 11, 2001, when Christopher Tolkien and Simon Tolkien disagreed on director Peter Jackson's take on J.R.R. Tolkien's trilogy. And ahead of the premiere, um, his you know Simon was going to be in attendance, but Christopher would not. Uh, the trilogy was not only made without any consultation with the estate of J.R.R. Tolkien, but also amidst disagreements among the author's family as to whether the movies should even be made. 42-year-old Simon said, At the time, it was my view that we should take a much more positive line in the film. That was overruled by my father. Uh, the British press reported that Christopher Tolkien, 77, refused to see Simon or take his phone calls to even discuss the production. Um, there basically is this... Uh, the, the, the long and short of it is that Christopher Tolkien did not approve of the works. Um, he even said he did make a quote. Um, I'm going to find it here real quick. He finally spoke out over the weekend, saying that he doubts any of his father's, any film of his father's ever work. He said, my own position is that Lord of the Rings is particularly unsuitable to transformation to visual dramatic form. On the other hand, I recognize that this is a debatable and complex question of art, and the suggestions that have been made that I disapprove of the films, whatever their cinematic quality, even to the extent of thinking ill of those with whom I may differ, are wholly without foundation. Now, he also made some statements kind of pointedly during his the times of the production, saying that he just didn't approve of the films being made whatsoever, because his father was apparently against it. And, and there's some more information here about the... the um, Biographer Michael White, who claims that J.R. Tolkien would have hated the current films, the current films being the Peter Jackson films, based on principle alone because he hated everything to do with Hollywood. The point here is that Christopher Tolkien notoriously didn't think that the films, didn't think that the books, excuse me, could be made into film format and therefore didn't want them to be made and didn't want any part of them. Concurrently, once that became publicly known, no one in the film even wanted to bother with consulting with the estate because they knew they were going to be railroaded at every turn. Now, this is also where Peter Jackson came in and said, 
and they can have opinions about the movie, but to have an attitude about the fact that the film got made in the first place is a little bit unfair to the people that own the rights, because the rights were sold by Tolkien himself in 1968. He cashed the check, he enjoyed the money, therefore the people who bought the rights should be allowed to make the film that they paid for. He also made a statement... Um, they had an opinion that if they were in any way connected to the film on some sort of a consultation basis, then it would be seen by everyone as the official token state adaption, and they felt that if they had no power or authority over the filmmakers, that they didn't want it, they didn't want to be seen as making it an official film. From our point of view, having to make three movies as complicated as these and having to run every decision by the Tolkien estate would have been an absolute impossibility. So basically, and I completely understand where Peter Jackson was coming with this, Christopher Tolkien was so notoriously anti-film that to make any sort of film adaptation while running things by Christopher Tolkien would have been next to impossible because he would have railroaded every single creative decision and he would have demanded a lot of things. And he that's not necessarily what you want if you're doing an adaptation. At the same time... We also can understand that Christopher Tolkien wanted things to be as true to the literary form as possible, which isn't necessarily always going to be possible given the complexities of adapting a literary property. Now, of course, Christopher Tolkien is dead and gone. And the son who was notoriously in favor of any, and this is the difference here, he was in favor of any type of adaptation being made to the point where, as we can see with the current um, production of The Rings of Power, Simon Tolkien is basically, this is a guy who, as far as I'm aware of, has no qualms about any sort of film or TV adaptations being made and is happy to let those go and happen however they're going to be happen because it's bringing money into the estate. And that's a difference of opinion that he and his father had. Now, his father's obviously out of the way now. Now, here's what I don't know, though. I don't know how much, if any, control Simon Tolkien has over the Tolkien estate. I don't know the current leadership at the Tolkien estate. All we know is that we're being told that Simon Tolkien was a consultant on the show. Whether or not he is a creative controlling component of the Tolkien estate or not, is something that I have no idea. As far as I understand things, the will, Christopher Tolkien's will left his own stuff to his wife. I think his wife passed and could be mistaken on that. But again, I don't know who's in control of the Tolkien estate these days, but I do know that there's a lot of talk around here that Simon Tolkien is, is consulting and the showrunners are saying that's great and other people are going, it's not so great because at least with Christopher Tolkien, despite his hard-headedness, we had someone who was going to do everything in his power to protect the literary, uh, you know, purity, so to speak, and ensure that any sort of film adaptation was truer to form than what Rings of Power it looks to be doing. Now, there's a whole lot of debate that could be happening here because we do understand, at least if you want any type of adaptation to be made, um, there needs to be some ability to move things around you know tom bombadil not a necessary component for a film adaptation but if you have a an individual in charge of the literary estate who is adamant that it must be in film exactly the way it is in literary form then you're never ever going to get any sort of adaptations made because you cannot do a direct adaptation there's so many things in the uh in the in the lord of the rings books that just don't translate into film and there was things that needed to be cut without a doubt the, the difference between Lord of the Rings is because it was very well established and we had a, we had three books that told us all about it. Whereas with the Second Age, they were going back and, and as they said, they're taking the breadcrumbs that Tolkien left and they are writing the novel that Tolkien never did, which allows them a great deal of creative liberties, which it appears that Simon Tolkien is happy to let them take. And he's even in even participating in those literary loopholes and let's just make shit up as we go along because he's profiting from it as a consultant and as a part of the Tolkien estate which of course is raking in huge 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 amounts of money for this adaptation so ah just one of those things I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments below thanks everybody see you next time